What you are about to witness started as an adventure, but quickly turned to a sobering lesson in history. Today, visitors to the Western Front can walk safely across no man's land. One generation of men could not. For them, the war was no adventure. Even though the guns fell silent 105 years ago, the scars of the Great War are still present today. Good morning. Happy Armistice Day. Happy Remembrance Day. Happy Veterans Day. It is November the 11th, 2023. And uh, this day marks the end of World War I, 105 years ago. Instead of bringing you a duck hunt or a hiking or climbing video, I'm doing something a little different today. And we're going to go for a walk along the Western Front in France and Belgium. I'm a deep lover of history. I've always loved reading, and being a good reader goes along with being a good historian. Um, I've got my first introduction to the discipline of history when I was a young kid, believe it or not, by watching the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, that movie introduced me to the story of World War II, and then I learned that my grandpa, when I got old enough to reckon, I learned that my grandpa was a veteran of World War II, which made him even more of a hero in my eyes. And uh, that sparked uh, very intense uh, studies and readings as a young child through elementary school, middle school, and into high school. Um, when I always, I had free time or as a hobby, you know, I was definitely reading books about great battles of World War II and just asking my grandpa a bunch of questions about his service. Now, I did know about World War I and that World War II was a sequel, uh, but I did not understand the complete significance of World War I until I went to college. Uh, my college history professor, Kay Gribble, uh, started her World War II class with a week-long unit just covering World War I and its significance, and it greatly uh, impacted my imagination and gave me a desire and um, an outlet of more studies linked to World War II. So um, all through college and up until this point in my life, you know, reading books about World War I has been one of my favorite genres um, of media to consume. So as with all adventures in my life, uh, reading is a big inspiration for a lot of things. And it was a huge inspiration uh, to go see the Western Front. Living here in the United States of America, it's uh, pretty hard just to go see all these places that I've read about. And when I got the chance to go see a part of the Western Front uh, this summer, I definitely accepted. Um, our friends, Brenda and Dennis, live in Germany. You know, you know, they invited us to come stay with them this summer. And uh, I had some options of things to do during that trip to Europe. And one option, and one thing that I've always you know, wanted to do, was to go to the battlefields of Verdun. And so uh, that was my first option. So we started planning, and we were planning out this trip. You know, it's like, okay, let's go to Verdun. And then, you know, we started small, because I didn't really know, like, what we could do in the time frame that we had. Um, and then this trip along the Western Front just started getting a lot bigger. Uh, Verdun led to Verdun and the Somme battlefields, and then after that we realized we had more time to spare, and so we threw in Vimy Ridge, and we ended our trip along the Western Front at the Belgian town of Ypres. This trip was a lot to take in. We only had one day at each location, a day at Verdun, we had a day to go explore the Somme battlefields, a day at Vimy Ridge, and we had, you know, like half a day to explore around the battlefields of Ypres. And so 
and all the time in between was spent traveling by train, bus, and bicycle. Uh, so it was a lot to consume, a lot of emotion to deal with, and a lot to remember from my background knowledge as I quickly moved through each section of the front. So because of that, as I'm telling the story, there's some inaccuracies because I'm in a hurry, and there's a lot of stuff that I left out of the story. The story of World War I is huge. It was a world war. It encompassed conflict all over the world, and the Western Front was just one part of it. And even there, I'm not getting the whole story in. So if anybody's watching who is an armchair historian like me, you know, go easy on me in the comments. I want people to leave comments, but uh, just keep in mind as I'm moving quickly, and there's a lot that I left out that could be added. I would like to send out a huge thank you and shout out to Brenda, Dennis, and Lena Hoffman, who live in ubach Pollenberg, Germany. Uh, they drove us to Verdun from their house. It was a four hour drive, but it really made it uh, easier on us because we didn't have to waste a day at the beginning uh, taking the bus. We were able to get to Verdun and explore the battlefield all in one day. So their help really set us off. On a, good, uh, on a good path, uh, set us up for success to see what we needed to see in the time allotted. So at the end of this video, I'll provide you with a list of readings and books that I have studied and used to build up my knowledge base. Uh, seeing the Western Front was so much more uh, beneficial after reading a lot of these books. I could understand a lot more. Um, but of course, reading only tells you so much and they're from various perspectives. Uh, to get the real feel of World War I, you got to go walk the trenches yourself. Enjoy. Well, good morning. It is uh, Sunday, July the 30th, 2023. And uh, don't really know how to present this next video, but... Uh, I'm at the Western Front, not the not Western Front between 1940 and 1945, but the Western Front 1914 to 1918. I'm starting this journey along the Western Front uh, here along the River Meuse in Eastern France and Verdun. Uh, we've approached from Luxembourg and we're coming down from the north uh, we're not too far from Verdun itself, and uh, as luck would have it, stumbled upon a German cemetery of war dead uh, from the First World War. There was nobody in the parking lot. Dennis was saying that's because no one wants to come and visit the German cemeteries. And that's until we came along. Um, so I guess this is my intro to the Western Front here at Verdun. Some of these crosses have the names of multiple soldiers in each grave. I'm going to ask Dennis here or Brenda to translate some of this German for us. Very simple cemetery. So obviously at this spot we're on the German side of the lines. Very quiet and quaint and like off the beaten path. You know, we wouldn't have known about this if we didn't see the sign pointing in the direction of it as we were driving down. Right here there are some really old gravestones that are intricately designed.
So Dennis, what are your initial impressions standing here? It's a weird feeling by almost 4,000 soldiers that are laying dead here with all of the nobody caring. It's just like grass and all of the gravestones. And then you see some newer ones, you saw them? I did. And some really old ones, like that one. What does that gravestone say? Here rests, and then it must be Pioneer. And that's like his last name. It's like w Wangle. Michel. And then, but then I don't know what that is. That's third GPB. Mm -hmm. Maybe Panzer Grand Battalion, like yeah. a tank battalion, or maybe Prussian Battalion, 11, and then 14th Company. I see. Yeah. And then he is born in Messel. 1891. Yeah. But I do not know what. And he died in 1916. Yeah. But I do not know what the. I was Googling it. And in the center of this cemetery, there's a mass grave that has around 300 German soldiers in it. I think this is a taste of what we have in store for us on our tour of this particular battlefield. Very quiet. On the Western Front, during the Great War, uh, Germany was mostly on the defense. And the Allies were, for good reason, trying to dislodge her from the territory that Germany had occupied in Belgium and Northern France. On three occasions, Germany went on the offensive. In 1914, at the beginning of the war, 1918 at the very end and one great gamble here at Verdun. Verdun, if I was French. And uh, they caught the French completely by surprise. They attacked along I think an eight kilometer front with a whole mass of cannon. And uh, the spot we're at right now the Bois de Curé, hopefully I'm saying that right, uh, was pretty much where the first assault happened. And now we are at the site of where the famous Colonel Drian made his last stand. This is the tomb of Colonel Drian, who held off the first waves of German invaders until he himself was killed with all of his men. And for a moment, there was a hole in the French lines that the Germans could have taken advantage of. And uh, after this opening phase of the battle of Verdun, here in this forest, a much grimmer chapter started. The actual monument to Colonel Drian. His body was actually moved around quite a bit after the war. The spot we were just at is where he actually died. And he was moved to another location and then to this location and then back to that location, it sounds like. forest has pretty much had to have been replanted. It was dead ground for a very long time. You can see all of the shell craters in this area. And it's very nice that nature has taken back over again. I'm sure we're going to see more of this 
on a much greater scale when we get up to the forts. size of that one right there. We're all over the place in here. Just kind of walking around through the forest here. And we found the opening to this shattered bunker. Obviously it's been filled in and pulverized. And uh, there's relics laying around all over the place on this battlefield. Verdun is a fortress town on the Moes. Uh, there are a lot of forts in this area. And the pride of France and the biggest one and most powerful one probably in this area at that time was this fort, Fort Duomo. It overlooks the surrounding area here, and a lot of drama unfolded on this site in 1916. In the months leading up to the German attack, French high command actually disarmed this fort, and it was not up to strength in garrison troops or armament when the Germans quickly punched through the French lines in February 1916. And we're just trying to figure out how to get inside of it. Verdun was an artillery duel on a massive scale. I think something like 10 to 11 million artillery shells dropped in this area. And you can see how the ground looks like a rough sea with shell craters. We are inside Fort Duomo. A handful of Germans captured this fort by squeezing in some pulverized holes undetected very early in the battle. And it was one of the darkest days for France. They had to muster all their forces to come to the defense. cost them hundreds of thousands to retake this fort later on in the battle. Dead end. Very damp, cavernous, dark, and 
creepy. It's just a light. Deep in the bowels of the fort, there's a German memorial right here. These two gebrannt im Burgischen Dritten, Vierten Brandenburgischen Sechsten. Sie wurden hier am 8. Mai 1916 bei der eines Munitionslagers getötet. Infolge des norddeutschen Artilleriefeuers. One thing that is interesting about uh, the Great War is a lot of the major players in the Second World War who had leadership roles were veterans of the Great War. One of them right here, Charles de Gaulle was a veteran of Verdun. Here's an overlay of the battlefield. Fort Duomo is right there. And it fell early in the battle. And this is the right bank of the Meuse. Here's the left bank of the Meuse. Verdun is right there. It's a town with no military significance. We'll talk about that later. And a problem that the Germans ran into is in the early stages of the battle, they attacked on the right bank of the Meuse and they left the left um, unopposed. And then the French moved their guns onto the left bank and used that to shoot into the flanks of the Germans, pretty much, from across the river. And it was a mistake that the Germans made that they should have attacked on the left bank as well as the right in the opening days of the battle. And unfortunately, the left had to be taken. So you have like these great struggles for Les Mort Home, and Cote 304. It's just gross cost of human life. Look at these artillery shells and the pieces of shrapnel. Most of the casualties in the Great War were a result of artillery fire. You can just see for scale this piece of shrapnel right here, or that piece right there next to my foot. Imagine what it would do to a man. We just finished our tour of the inside of the fort <laughs> and now we're going to go up on top. Check it out. We're now on top, Fort Duomo. Here's the 155 millimeter retractable gun turret. It would go down in, come back up. And you can see the dominant view that this fort has over the surrounding countryside. It's literally like the highest point around here. And you can also see the intense damage 
from the artillery clashes that happened here. I think over there on the horizon is Le Mort Home, the Dead Man's Hill. It had that name before the battle, but it lived up to its name as a result of it. And that was what I was talking about earlier. The Germans failed or did not think to take the left side of the river before they came down on the right. And I can see now how exposed they were to infilid fire from the left. One last 360 from the top of Fort Duomo. After World War I, the uh, mindset of the French and the Germans was vastly different going into World War II. French, believing in the power of the forts to withstand an attack, pulled their money in on more forts, the Maginot Line. Germans went all in on tanks to go around the forts that they also knew were uh, impervious to attack. The seeds of the Second World War, in a way, were kind of sown here on the slopes. These heights. mentioned before that this forest was replanted, I think in the 1970s. Before that, the ground was pretty dead here. And look at the remnants of these old trenches and running in amongst all the shell craters that are still here. just down the hill from Duomo and you arrive at the Verdun Ossuary. We just got done touring the inside of the Ossuary. I have to say um, it's very, very quiet. You could hear a pin drop in there. There's a chapel 4,000 engraved names. It doesn't matter on the nationality, German and French, of those who, uh, who never returned from the Battle of Verdun. And then underneath, underneath the floor, are the skeletal remains of unknown soldiers who've been found around the battlefield. Ultimately, they were interred here. I'm not going to take any pictures of them. You could, but out of respect for the dead, I'm not. The Germans, under the orders of Erich von Falkenhayn, their chief of staff, attacked here at Verdun uh, for one goal. They just wanted to bleed the French army white. And the word was called attrition. Eric von Falkenhayn knew that if they attacked here at Verdun, the French would pour in every ounce of strength to defend it. And he was right, they did. Uh, by the hundreds of thousands, Frenchmen died to defend a symbol, as well as the Germans. In fact, he wasn't planning on losing as many Germans as French in the battle. I think there's some, somewhere around 300,000 casualties for the French, kind of equal, maybe a little less for the Germans. And 
you know, if you want to get a reminder of the waste of the Great War, just look at that. Here's the result of Falkenhayn's plan of attrition. What a waste. No military significance at Verdun, other than Falkenhayn and the Germans knew that attacking here that the French would do everything in their power to keep the Germans from taking Verdun, which to them was of huge nationalistic importance. The battle turned into a titanic struggle between Teuton and Gaelic cultures. And Verdun itself has a history of sieges and battles going all the way back to the Roman times. In fact, Charlemagne's heirs to his throne signed the Treaty of Verdun, separating France from Germany, I believe, in the early Middle Ages. And I could be wrong about all of this, just an armchair historian. Here's the other side of the cemetery. comes to my mind looking at this is here's all the reminders of the destruction of man and what we're capable of doing and yet it seems like sometimes in our world nothing really ever changes After touring Fort Duomo and the Ossuary, we spent a few hours going through the museum at Verdun. The museum was modern and had three floors of exhibits that were all-encompassing and very well put together. There were a lot of artifacts found on the battlefield and from the home front. All aspects of the battle were covered from the weapons to uniforms to medical supplies. Both sides of the story, French and German, were covered in this museum. Altogether, it brought the First World War and the Battle of Verdun to life. You can see here, just everywhere under the underbrush, if it's cleared out, you can see the damage from the artillery. You can see over there how it's just all grown in and thick. And here it's been kind of mowed back, just to give you a sense of the pockmarked moonscape. <coughs> this must be a chapel here on the site of the old village. Exploitation farm. So this must have been a farm right here. Look at all of the shell craters everywhere. You step off of the main trail and you get into the woods. It's kind of creepy. 
There's all kinds of junk laying around on the bottom of the forest floor here, amid the shell craters. If there was a haunted place on Earth, it would be a place like this. This is not a place I'd want to sleep out overnight. Good morning. Uh, we are walking around through the city of Verdun on our way to the bus station. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, the rest of the Battle of Verdun before we move on to another portion of the Western Front. Um, talked a lot about the Germans and their basic strategy yesterday. I'd like to talk about the French right now. As I mentioned, holding Verdun was a ma matter of national pride. And uh, during the crisis in the first couple of days of the German offensive in February, General Joffre brought forward General Patain and brought him here and gave him orders to hold Verdun at all costs. Now, Patain did not agree with the philosophy of the French high command at the time, which was to attack and attack and attack. Patain instead used firepower to fight back and tried to keep the French troops in high morale. He rotated them, he made sure they didn't spend a lot of time in the front lines, he gave them plenty of time to rest and recoup. Um, and he was here for about 10 weeks and he did hold the line and he became like this mystical figure, you know, of the Battle of Verdun. But of course his bosses did not like that. And I think after about 10 weeks they sacked him. They didn't sack him, they just made him the boss of the whole campaign. They moved him away from Verdun, here on the lines, and put him further behind the front. And he still called the shots, but not like he was here, you know, running the battle firsthand. His replacements, General Nivelle and General Mangan, uh, wholeheartedly agreed with the philosophy of attack. That's what they did. Uh, I think around May, June, July, they ordered uh, just tons of costly counterattacks against the Germans to take back Fort Duomo, Fort Vaux, um, and pretty much all the heights surrounding Verdun. They just attacked uh, under the belief that Human strength and sheer willpower alone is enough to overcome artillery and machine guns. And the results of that, well, saw that yesterday up there at the Ojuary, and they fed right into Falkenhayn's plan. Here's downtown Verdun. Keep in mind, the city was leveled during the war, and it has been rebuilt, and people have moved back. And here is the River Mose. Here are the real heroes of Verdun. A common soldier. The French Poilus. Ordered to attack against insurmountable odds. They gave their life's blood to put out the fires of the crucible on the fort surrounding this town. Here's the old castle city walls of Verdun. Sarah said it was built around 1380. Let's head into the city center. The same person who see there's the gate. There's the gate. city center. This is the monument of victory to the soldiers of Verdun. Even though in the Great War I don't really feel like there was any winners or losers 
because it was a prequel to a much bigger conflict. What really took the pressure off of this battle was the opening of the great Allied offensive along the Somme River. Good morning. It is August the 1st, and we have left the battlefields of Verdun. We've arrived at the train station at Albert, Picardy. And we're about to head to the battlefields of the Somme. In fact, we kind of arrived as uh, I would think a lot of British soldiers arrived here at this battlefield. First, we're going to go check out the Museum of the Somme, 1916, right up here at the cathedral. And then we're going to head out to Beaumont Hamel and the Thiepval Monument. Here's the cathedral in the town center of Albert. The museum is inside of it or underground, underneath of it, I believe. To see what it's all about. We are in the Museum of the Somme, 1916, and it is underneath of the church. It's kind of cool how they've had it, got it all set up. There's a video and then exhibits. Tons of artifacts in these cases as you walk down this first ha uh, hallway. All relics found on the battlefields here. And exit the museum into this courtyard and I have to say that was really well done both museums at Verdun which was very modern and here at the Somme which was more like old school and rustic are worth every dollar spent to see it sets you up perfectly to go tour uh, all the parts of the battlefield and it's a vast battlefield and we only have time to see maybe a few spots before we move further up the front. This is the river Anker. It's just a lovely garden and courtyard that they place you in as you leave the museum. The museum was uh, situated in a subterranean tunnel it started at the church right there. You can see how far it takes you underground. And we gotta walk back. We're gonna grab bikes and go check out a couple of sites along the battlefield. So after the museum back in Albert, we went to the tourist office and rented bicycles. I strongly recommend doing that if you want to see these battlefields. So there's a lot of space to cover and it's too much to walk in a day if you don't have a tour. And it's about eight kilometers from Albert out here to uh, Thiepval, the memorial uh, to the 
Anglo-French soldiers that fought here on the Somme. Uh, a couple days ago we were at Verdun and a big reason why uh, the uh, offensive from the Germans ended at Verdun was because the Allies, Anglo-French Allies, launched their major offensive here on the Somme battlefields along the Somme River and the River Anker. If you know anything about the Battle of the Somme, uh, the British launched a major artillery bombardment of the German lines. It lasted for, I think, a couple weeks before they sent their troops up over the top. Now, they did not have the element of surprise, as the Germans did at Verdun. The Germans completely surprised the French in February 1916, it was not so uh, here. The Germans had heavily fortified positions because, you know, they were on occupied territory and they were here to stay. They had very deep dugouts, dug sometimes, I think, 20 meters under the ground, impervious to all the artillery bombardment. So they were pretty safe from all the bombs being dropped on them. Once the artillery barrage ended, the British got up out of their trenches and they walked. Single file line, shoulder to shoulder across no man's land toward the German defenses, which they were told would have been, you know, completely destroyed and they would have been able to walk over it. Instead, as the artillery barrage lifted, the Germans came out of their holes and uh, mowed down the British walking across no man's land. And on July 1st, 1916, the British Empire suffered their greatest military defeat ever. Ever. I think in one day, something in the terms of 60,000 casualties, that's killed, wounded, and missing in action, and around 20,000 dead. That was just in one day. And right now, I'm standing in the presence of the largest Commonwealth War Memorial here on the Western Front. It is the Deep Fall Arch. Right there. And it's dedicated to the missing of the Somme. Let's go check it out. The Deep Fall Memorial in Anglo-French Cemetery that commemorates by name some 72,000 men who fell on the Somme sector up to 20th of March 1918 and who have no known grave by name. Every single flat wall on this memorial has a name on it.
outside of the memorial. I think those are British graves. You get more of that traditional headstone and the French get a cross. Every square inch of each panel on either side of this memorial is covered with names. And then in the reeds, they have specific places for some battlefield. I don't know if the names on the panel coincide if they were found in that section of the front. This is the museum here at Tiapfa. Very well done. They do a really good job with these uh, exhibits. In the ground, you can see how uh, there's artifacts and flotsam and jetsam of war. pieces of shrapnel. I like how they put all the artifacts underground, because that's kind of how they would have been found. Just down the road from the Typeful Memorial is the Ulster Memorial Tower. I guess this is a replica of a tower in Ireland. Let's go see what we can learn about it. When you walk in, it says here, this tower is dedicated to the glory of God and grateful memory of the officers, non-commissioned officers, and men of the 36th Ulster Division of the sons of the Ulster and other forces who lay down their lives in the Great War, and all their comrades in arms who by divine grace were spared to testify to their glorious deeds. It was erected on the site of the famous advance of the Ulster Division on the 1st of July, 1916. And our last stop on the Somme battlefield is here at the Beaumont Hamel Newfoundland Regiment Battlefield Park. I've heard this is one of the best sites to visit on the Western Front. Already I can tell it's very well kept. It is technically Canadian soil, even though Newfoundland was not part of the Canadian Confederation at the time of the Great War. It was a part of the British Commonwealth. We're going to the visitor center and get oriented with the place.
This site is particularly special because the trenches are still preserved and they're in very good condition, as well as the impact craters. Now, we learned at the visitor center that Newfoundland staunchly refused to fight for Canada during the Great War and they formed their own Newfoundland regiment to fight for Great Britain. Uh, here at the Battle of the Somme, they were a part of the second wave of attack. Around 8 o'clock a.m., they attacked the German lines. And uh, out of 800-something members of the regiment, they suffered around 80% casualties. And by the next day, something like 60 of them were around for roll call. After the war, and because so many of sons, fathers, and just quality men were lost in the battle, Newfoundland reverted back to a colony, and they didn't become a part of the Canadian Confederation until 1949. We also learned that Canada owns about 80% of the Western Front between these two parks, Beaumont, Hamill, and Vimy Ridge, next to Arras. Now, this is in really good shape. Right now we are on the Newfoundland lines, and I guess over on the other side of the park are the German lines. I'm gonna go walk the trenches here in just a moment. There's Sarah down there. I'm kind of just ascending this memorial to the regiment. And it's a caribou. I wonder if this rock is actually from Newfoundland. Pretty good view over the battlefield. Sarah's ancestry is from Newfoundland. And what did you just find, Sarah? Um, J.T. Morrissey on the wall below is a casualty of war. And who is that person? Um, I'm not sure how they're related to me, but at the time, Newfoundland was very small. Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but less than 250,000 people. I think it's 212,000 population. So I imagine we must have been related somehow. So one of your ancestors possibly was a casualty here at the Battle of the Somme. Yeah. History is pretty crazy, isn't it? It's pretty awesome. I think what's cool about this park is you can still walk the trenches. These would have been the lines of the Newfoundland Regiment. The German lines are on the other side of the park. And I'm assuming we'll make our way over there if we follow the tour correctly. Up there in that tree line would have been front lines of the Newfoundland Regiment. And right now I'm standing in what was no man's land. And this is called the Danger Tree, right here. And I guess this is as far as a lot of them made it. In about 30 minutes of combat, there's roughly 86% casualties by the time they reached this tree. Horrible statistics. 
And now we're making our way off towards the German front lines. Y Ravine Cemetery. A lot of unknown graves, known but to God. So these are the German lines. They were dug much deeper. They had better uh, dugouts underground and much thicker barbed wire defenses because they were the occupiers and didn't really want to leave. And you can just see the field of fire that they had looking off towards the front lines of the Newfoundland Regiment. There along that tree over there. This is the 51st Highland Regiment Memorial. It's behind the German lines. So I wonder why they were being memorialized at this spot. This was the regiment that eventually took Beaumont Hamill in November 1916. But unfortunately, all this ground was lost back to the Germans in their 1918 Michael Offensive just before the end of the war. The Battle of the Somme lasted officially till November 1916. It, so it went between July 1st till November, the cost of 1,200,000 casualties from all sides involved. The fighting here continued all the way up pretty much till the end of the war in November 1918. So this is a mine crater. All along the front, in the opening stages of the Battle of the Somme, was welcomed with the detonation of several large underground mines that kind of atomized the Germans if they happened to be here. It was intended to just blow giant holes in their trenches and give the Allies hope that they could just walk right over them. And this is the third cemetery here at Beaumont Hamill. This is the Hawthorne Ridge Cemetery. Don't know how many soldiers are buried here. All the grounds are very well kept. This is a piece of Canada here in France. And it's just a symbol of their national identity. Very well put together and maintained. The cemetery has the remains of some 200 something servicemen, of which around 60 unidentified. And they were pretty much found in this area of no man's land and this was like the best place to make a cemetery and give them a proper burial. Both Sarah and I spent so much time reading about the Western Front and no man's land in our early years and into adulthood. We never thought we'd get the chance to actually walk across it safely.
Here's a list of readings and books that helped with the making of this video. Let's start with the reference. Uh, these two books here are great reference materials about World War I. Jay Winter and Blaine Baggett, The Great War, and uh, The First World War by John Keegan. This was actually a textbook of mine. Really good uh, reference material. Recommend it for sure. Okay, but moving on. Okay. Barbara Touchman's The Guns of August. Really good read, a page turner, but it covers uh, the prelude to World War I and the opening months of the conflict. Uh, just a must read for anybody who loves history, just because Barbara Touchman has a way with words. Primary source, Ernst Jünger's Storm of Steel. You can tell this one's been through a lot kind of like he was in the war. He served all four years on the Western Front, wounded multiple times, uh, and he was at the Battle of the Somme. Uh, this book covers all battles he was in, but a lot of it is about um, his experiences in the opening days of the British Somme Offensive, but he was on the German side of the lines. Ian Ousby's The Road to Verdun. Uh, this is a secondary source, and he makes a claim that the slaughter at Verdun can be most laid to blame on the foot of the French uh, and their folly of nationalism. So when I'm talking about French dying for a myth and uh, for their nationalistic ideals, this is the book I'm referring to. Uh, there's a lot in there. Whether you agree or disagree with that, uh, read the book and see what his argument is. One of the best books on the Battle of Verdun, Alistair Horne's The Price of Glory, Verdun 1916, also a secondary source. Uh, I use this book a lot uh, in putting together this video for just a lot of the information. A page turner, very good writer. Um, could probably read this one in a day or two. Stephen O'Shea's Back to the Front. This is the main inspiration for me to do a trip like this. He did it over several years and much more thorough analysis and investigation of all the battlefields. Um, but in a way, I'm kind of following in Stephen O'Shea's footsteps. Uh, he's a French-Canadian. He went to the front uh, looking for answers about his own family members. And uh, just a really good read. He mixes in pieces of history and the story along the way. And lastly, everything you need to know about World War I can probably be learned by reading this soul book. Eric Marie Remarque's All Quiet on the Western Front.